through the end of the chapter. John chapter 3, beginning with verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized. For John had not yet been put in prison. Now, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and the Jew over purification. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. But I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has heard, seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its testimony to your work of redemption. And we pray that as we consider uh, more of its wonderful riches, that your spirit uh, would be enliven our hearts, quicken our minds, and uh, reveal things to us that we might truly understand your will and your ways. We pray, Lord, that you would work graciously in our midst this day. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Back in the bygone era, perhaps now considered the dark ages of uh, the American Republic, college students just to be able to gather in their dorms and have what were called bull sessions, where they can argue out different points of view and have real disagreements with each other. And oddly, nobody was offended. Nobody claimed that uh, they needed a safe space None of these kinds of things developed. We uh, talked about our different points of view, even on a Christian college campus. There could be differences on a variety of points of view. I took part in some of those kinds of things, of course, and most other college students would do so as well. I remember one time, not at college, but in, in a former home church of mine as I was a college student preparing for the ministry that a seminar was held on the topic of baptism and this church uh, argued from the point of view of uh, Baptists today that in order for you uh, to be baptized you must make a credible profession of faith so you must be of age at least to be able to understand the gospel and give testimony to God's work in your heart and then when you were baptized you would be immersed in a pool of water in front of the congregation and, and uh, thereby be received into the communion of the church. And so there were arguments made to uh, 
uh, promote and defend that point of view, and I'd have to say that in listening to those arguments, I came away no, no clearer understanding, I think, of what baptism meant. So I had to study it further. And of course, my views have changed from that time, although I really didn't understand or adopt any particular view at that time. It should not be surprising to us that there are different points of view within the life of the church and there can be disagreements or discussions about these kinds of things. Certainly that was the case in the days of John the Baptist. Uh, John was baptizing uh, a little bit north of Jesus. Jesus had finished his discussion with Nicodemus and there in Jerusalem and following the, the festival there he went into Judea and was out towards the area of Jericho baptizing folks and uh, John will comment that uh, yes crowds were coming to Jesus to be baptized but Jesus himself was not actually personally baptizing anyone he delegated that to his disciples and so they were baptizing folks uh, John was further north up by what uh, the gospel describes here is Anon by Salim. And uh, it, it, it's a location about midway up the, the Jordan River. Uh, and John does give us this one description that it has many waters, or excuse me, much waters, as uh, some translations will have. Um, the English Standard Version has plentiful waters. And that's the point where some of my Baptist friends will pick up that phrase, there was much water there, and say, well, there you see, uh, there needed to be much water for, their, for a baptism to take place because the individual needed to be immersed under the water. So you need a good bit of water for that. And here, John had a suitable location for that. However, the, the location where this was at was likely a spot where there were seven springs of water. So there were, the, the, the Greek word there that's translated in some places as much could also be translated as many. There were many waters. Some of our modern translations kind of avoid the, uh, committing themselves one way or the other and say plentiful waters. You make up your own mind as to the nature of the waters there. But there were multiple springs there of water, which did not necessarily mean then that you have a, a big river of water or a lake of water where people could come in and, and be immersed into. Uh, a spring of water would be uh, a little bit of water on the ground that you could stoop down to and, and, walk, and, and sprinkle some. Uh, in my view, again, the scriptural pattern for baptism would be to sprinkle the individual. It represents not the immersion of somebody going down into the grave with Christ and rising up from the dead in that way, but rather it represents being united to Christ in his death, have the Spirit poured out upon you, and being washed and cleansed of your sin. And so as the sprinkled water comes down upon you, it symbolizes the Holy Spirit who baptized the church at Pentecost in tongues of fire as it came down upon the church. Uh, the Spirit comes down upon us and the, the sign of baptism and sprinkles our hearts clean and our consciences clean of sin. Now, the point of discussion between John's disciples and a Jew, and some translations will say Jews, it, again, it really doesn't matter Jew or Jews, there was somebody there who had an objection. I somewhat wondered to myself that maybe John himself, the gospel writer, was the one who posed the question to the disciples of John. And it, it struck me as looking at this text that I was wondering, well, John the Baptist has pointed to Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and encourages the disciples to go after him. Why didn't John go along with them as well, John the Baptist, and join them in that ministry? But it was not... God's purpose for John the Baptist to do that. And I think what you see here is a little bit of an overlap with the times here. John was one who uh, was the, uh, the last, if you will, of the great prophets of the old covenant period of time. In fact, one perhaps even greater than the 
previous ones because he was the forerunner of the Messiah. He came to announce the arrival of the Christ. And John was very conscious of this. He understood that he fulfilled the role that Malachi spoke of long ago in the third chapter of his prophecy when he said that, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face. John was that messenger. And Mark's gospel combines, in the first chapter, combines Malachi's testimony and Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 40, brings them together and says, uh, John was that voice that cried out into the wilderness, make the path straight for the Lord. And so John was one who understood his unique role and function in redemptive history. He was the forerunner for the Messiah. His purpose was to point people to the Messiah. And he formed this transition of the ages, such that with John and, and with his generation, the uh, old Mosaic age was coming to a close. With John uh, and, and his day, the, the temple services were coming to an end. The fulfillment of all the prophecies made long ago were, were now at their a moment of fulfillment. Uh, Jesus has arrived. The Christ has arrived. And now a new age is breaking forth. The gospel age is breaking forth. And that old earthly temple will be deconstructed. It will collapse. As when Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom, signifying the end of that old covenant ritual. And it, with Jesus, a new temple would be built, a spiritual temple, the people of God, the kingdom of God, Jesus himself being the temple, God himself, his own body. And so John was a transitional figure. Jesus himself comments on John later on when Jesus raises the question in Matthew chapter 11, when he says to the people, what did you go out to see when you went to see John? And he asked that question three times, building suspense. What did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? A man uh, at, at the king's side? Who did you go to see? Well, Jesus defined him. He was a prophet and more than a prophet. John occupied a unique role in redemptive history. But significantly, Jesus would say of John that he who is least in the kingdom of heaven was greater than John. Those of us who have entered into the new covenant church in Jesus Christ have greater privileges. We enjoy a greater spiritual reality than what John himself understood in his day. Indeed, in the, the context of Matthew 11, John was questioning whether they should be waiting for somebody else or whether Jesus was the one that they were to be looking for. We don't have those kinds of questions, or we shouldn't have those kinds of questions. Jesus indeed is the Christ. And so John played a unique role in redemptive history, a pivotal role. And so when uh, the uh, disciples of John came to him with this Jew or a, a group of Jews who come up at him and, and, and ask questions about purification, which was probably a, a general word that included the idea of baptism. Who were the subject of baptism? Remember we spoke some time ago about whether it was appropriate for Jews to be baptized with water that was usually reserved for Gentiles or converts into Judaism. Uh, and so who was the object of baptism? What was the perhaps the, the correct mode of baptism, but the question here seems to be, who is it who has authority to actually baptize others? You know, John has been the one who's been doing all the baptizing here, and people, crowds are coming to John for his unique ministry. And it may be that his disciples, it appears that his disciples were jealous of John's privileges, jealous of the attention given to John, and wanted to make sure that there was no um, defections or offshoots that were rising up to create competition. And word comes around that Jesus and his disciples were also baptizing, and in fact, great crowds were going to Jesus now. 
So probably the crowds around John were, were diminishing, getting smaller and smaller, and the disciples around them were getting a little bit worried. This is our livelihood here. They're concerned about that. And so they come up to John and ask him about it. And John has to correct their thinking and remind them of his unique role. He is, as he said, not the Christ. He is not the one that people were to be seeking. Instead, there was somebody else. And so the focus of his ministry was to point people to Jesus Christ. And he makes use of a, a, a holy illustration in terms of the marriage ceremony where the friend of the groom accompanies the, the groom as he goes to meet the bride. And, and, and when the wedding is set, the friend of the groom is not interested in marrying the bride. He's concerned about the groom himself and rejoices to see him there and rejoices to see the joy between these two, between this couple. John says, that's my role. I'm here to, if you will, assist in the wedding. There are two statements here that John makes with regard to this whole situation here which have tremendous pastoral value for us today, it seems to me. One is that a man cannot receive anything except it comes to him from heaven. Verse 27. When he looks at his position in life and uh, perhaps uh, the rise of Jesus, if you will, at his own expense, uh, John is not perplexed by that. He's not anxious about that. Rather, he receives that as a gift from heaven. And he recognizes that all good things that he enjoys come to him from heaven. And that brings a certain peace that occupies the soul. That my life is governed by the providence of God, my God, my Heavenly Father. And though in this stage of my life, uh, perhaps I'm not receiving the attention and the, the uh, notoriety that I once had, Nonetheless, this is God's plan for me, and I can rest in that. John's going to have something else to say in a moment which coordinates with this, but it's so important for us to have a sense of the divine providence, God's care over the course of our lives, and how he has apportioned out to us uh, the, the experiences that we have. And we should not grumble or complain about that or grow frustrated that, you know, I want more. I want something else. Isn't that what happens within our hearts? We get frustrated with where we're at in life. We see things that we'd like to be able to do, and we're frustrated. We can't get beyond that. There's boundaries there. We just can't get past. All kinds of different things, whether it's health, age, employment, uh, spiritual gifts, uh, material wealth, what have you, there are limits placed on us. Now you can be frustrated with those things and grumble about them and complain and think that God is keeping you from something. Or you can look at it as God's sovereign providence. His good pleasure, which is for your good at this moment in your life. And begin to look for that which God wants you to see. John took great pleasure in the advance of Jesus Christ. There are ways in which we too can take pleasure in the things that God is doing all around us. The other statement that John made was, He must increase, but I must decrease. Now that is a very mature thing to say. Especially when you are a minister. As one commentator noted, Leon Morris, he said that uh, it's very difficult to attract a crowd and to have a, a group of followers around you and to maintain their loyalty over a period of time. But to take those people and to urge them to follow somebody else, that takes great self-denial. It's very difficult to do that sort of thing. 
John said, he must increase, but I must decrease. And it's the decrease side of things that uh, makes us concerned, anxious, worried. Because as we decrease, we kind of slip from view. And we no longer seem to have the significance that we once had. And so that takes a great measure of faith, does it not, to be willing to allow that decrease to occur so that someone else might advance. On a, on a happier note, it's at this time of year that young parents are taking their little children off to school and leaving them off into the hands of our uh, pluralistic pagan public school system. At any rate. And many are sending their children to good Christian schools as well. And in, in any case, you know, the experience of, of a young parent in bringing their child, particularly the, the mother brings her son or daughter to kindergarten or first grade for the first time, uh, brings the child to the doorstep, and it's a very emotional thing for both mother and child. Child's being separated from his parent and has a lot of strangers all around and might be quite nervous and anxious about that, and the mother has to let go of her child and let this child begin to experience new things and trust the care of the school, the teacher and the administrators and so forth for that child. And so it can be a very difficult thing. But parents are in the business of helping their children mature and become independent. That child must increase. And really, in time, we must decrease as parents. Our role as parents diminishes over time as a child becomes more mature and becomes more and more independent until there comes a time when that child goes off on their own. We know what it, it, it feels like to have this intention, at least good parents do, of seeing that their children increase and grow this is how we should look upon our lives in, at large. There is not merely the call of love to see others mature, whether we are a business person and we have employees and we want them to mature and develop and grow and to uh, expand their capabilities, and with that, the business grows as well. But uh, in, in every endeavor, whether we are business people, educators, um, scientists, what have you, in every case, we really should be looking at not really the horizontal level about developing people and their abilities and these kinds of things, but see that as a part of exalting Jesus Christ. As those who are redeemed of the Lord, it's my purpose to see Christ exalted within my family, within my business, within my school, within my government, and all kind of within the country at large, in the movie industry, wherever it might be, let Jesus increase. And may every aspect of life be lived for his glory and praise. And however that might be, may I decrease. May the attention not be on me, but on Jesus Christ. He must increase, but I must decrease. What an amazingly mature thing for John to say, but we would not expect anything less of this great one. Now, John could say that because in the context of this text, he has faith in the special role and person of Jesus. Now, I said last week that sometimes our Bibles will have a red letter edition where the words of Jesus are in red print. Other uh, characters in the course of the Bible don't get that special treatment. John the Baptist's words are in black ink. But when we look at this text, it may be that you have John the Baptist commenting, beginning with verse 22, on through, what is it, about verse 28 or so. But then you have, I think, the end of John's conversation and the Apostle John then picking up once again and making commentary on the basis of this whole section of Scripture. 
the interview of Jesus with Nicodemus, and then the conversation with regard to John the Baptist and his relationship to Jesus Christ. And John, the apostle, the author of the gospel now, brings this section to a close where he talked about Jesus being lifted up and John saying he must increase, the Baptist saying he must increase, John the Apostle now reminds us of who this Jesus is. He is the one who comes from above. The Baptist is of the earth. John is of the earth. We are all of the earth. We are limited. We are creatures. We are fallible. We have our weaknesses and our shortcomings. We have our sins. But Jesus is on a completely different level. He is the eternal God who has come from heaven. Clearly, John the Apostle and John the Baptist saw in Jesus the Son of God. He was pre-existent. And so he is one who intentionally left the glories of heaven, the presence of the Father, and came down into this world with a message from the Father, which he perfectly communicates to us today. <coughs> and so he speaks as the Word of God, the message that the Father has given to him to speak. And he speaks it with clarity and with great authority. And so therefore, we should join in with John the Baptist and say, he must increase. We must listen to what this one has to say because of his nature as a son of God, because of his uh, entrance into our world and his revelation of what the Father has to say to us. And so he must increase. Sadly, the apostle notes that despite this one speaking today, many will not listen. Many will not hear. But many will go their own way. They will not listen to the very Son of God who came from the very presence of God in heaven above to speak to us. And so they go their own way. And so John wonders at all that and is amazed that we should depart from this one and he concludes by saying everyone who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Here's a great word of hope and of salvation by trusting in Jesus, believing what he has to say, believing that he faithfully reports that which the Father has given to him to say, recognizing and trusting that all he says about the way of salvation is true that he can indeed forgive our sins, that he can bring us into heaven and reconcile us to God, and he's, he will do that by his death on the cross and his resurrection. We trust him for that, and we receive everlasting life. Life without end. True life. The abundant life. Not mere existence, not mere length of days, but the fullness of life. Life with joy, love, peace, righteousness, goodness, gentleness, all these blessings are ours in Jesus as we believe in Him. But then John gives the converse here, the alternative. Those who do not obey the Son shall not see life, but have the wrath of God abide on them. Note first the contrast that John draws here in, in these words that he uses. Those who believe in Jesus and those who do not obey Him. Believing and obeying are two sides in some respects of the same thing. If we trust in Jesus, we will live for Him. We will obey Him. But those who don't trust in Him will not obey Him. And the wicked refuse to submit themselves to the Word of Christ. And they go their own way. And so John says they will perish and endure the wrath of God forever and ever. Now that is a terrible, terrifying thing. I remember as a boy I was sitting at my parents' dining room table 
and they would have, sometimes have a candle at the table, and it would, it would be lit. And I'd sit there, and maybe my brothers were sitting around the table or something, maybe we were waiting for dinner to come or something like that, but I would look at that candle there and see that flame and put my finger through the flame. I'm sure you've done that. I, I hope I'm not that odd. <laughs> but if you pass your finger through the flame at, at a good pace, you're not going to get burned. It won't hurt. But you slow down just a little bit, and you feel the heat of that tiny little flame. Jesus said, hell is a lake of fire. And the wicked will be cast in there not just to pass through, but forever and ever without hope of any remedy whatsoever. I was watching, I think I saw, I was watching a program on television about various space, unique things in space, and had a vision of the sun, this ball of fire, and it was an explosion, an eruption of gas is going up and flames going up and the camera was watching all of that, the telescope was watching that. And I thought to myself, look at this ball of fire, this sun which heats our day and lights. You just look at that for a split second too long and your eyes are going to be in trouble. Imagine being cast into the sun and the millions of degrees of heat that it has. Now I say that in part, yes, to frighten people, because the wrath of God is serious. We should flee the wrath of God and run to the Savior Jesus Christ that we might be forgiven of sin and have everlasting life. Today is the day of salvation. May we all adopt this view of John that he must increase. And in this life, I will decrease. But there will come a time when Jesus will raise me up from the dead, raise us up, exalt us, glorify us with Christ, and we will share his glory in new heavens and new earth, forever and ever and ever. And so John and I will sit down at a cafe in glory and we'll be sharing stories from our past, and Jack will come alongside and we'll have a good old time forever and ever. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this message of hope and everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to share this good news with lost humanity, that many would turn from their sin and look to Jesus for salvation. We thank you for John the Baptist and his testimony. We pray that we too would look to Jesus and follow him. In whose name we pray. Amen.